Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, so, uh, hello, my name is Fiona. I'm, I have the privilege of being President and Chief Exec of Providence Healthcare, and I'm really honoured to have the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Um, so, I was asked to speak about personalised kidney care, and that's quite daunting, given I'm speaking to a, a group of experts on that, um, and you all know a lot more than me. But I thought I would give you my personal take on what personalised healthcare for renal patients means to me, and hopefully just give you some different perspectives and things to think about on this important issue. And so I guess I started off by thinking that there are really two different aspects to personalised healthcare. And some people think about it in terms of biological terms. How do we understand each person's genomic and biochemical uniqueness? and give them exactly the right drug or other treatment. And other people think in terms of social personalization, understanding what's important to each individual and ensuring that our care meets their personal wishes and priorities, that they feel recognized and cared for as a unique person. So this is my first test of this, uh, the technology here, um, which is hopefully going to guess, give you a question um, and I would ask you to vote on which of these you think is the most important in personalised healthcare. Basically, the kind of biological approach or the social approach. And I'm hoping that we can get some fairly immediate results on this. You'll have to have time to vote. I think I'm from the generation where, which thinks that really flip charts are the best thing to use. Um, <laughs> in terms of you can never go wrong with a good flip chart, it never fails you. That's technology. <laughs> there we go. Ah, oh, okay, so we're all about social, a social approach. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, talk about both. And then just to give you a, a heads up at the end of my talk, I'm going to ask you to vote again and to just to see if I've had any impact in any way. Um, there's no, I don't think it's a right answer, but I think it is interesting to kind of compare the two approaches. So as I said, um, when I was asked to speak today, I did feel a bit daunted about, well, I don't know that much about this. So I thought I should go speak to some experts. So I went to talk to some kidney patients at St Paul's. Um, to ask them about what personalised healthcare means to them, because I thought they are the experts. So, this is Shelley, who I went and had a chat to. So, she's in her mid-50s. She comes to St Paul's three times a week for haemodialysis, and she's had to do this since her first kidney transplant failed. But she was really keen to talk to me about how that transplant had lasted 17 years and how much life that had given her in 17 years. So I chatted to her for about half an hour about you know, life in general and um, living in the lower mainland until I found out that actually she's from Haida Gwaii and her grandfather was a hereditary chief. So she talked to me about um, taking week-long fishing trips with her family, including her baby son, how rough the seas were, how much fish there were, how big the fish were, that's the first rule of fishing I've discovered in BC, isn't it? The fish are always big. Um, but in all seriousness, her, ch her life has changed so much in terms of now living in Vancouver, having to cope with a number of other health conditions. So a few years ago, she had a seizure that fractured two vertebrae. She suffers from short-term memory loss from a head injury, and she's really hoping for a second transplant. So I asked Shelley, what could we do better? How could we make your healthcare more personalised? And to be honest, she was really unhelpful. <laughs> um, she, she couldn't think of anything. Um, she just said, quote, I think everything is great because I'm still here. Um, and she absolutely recognised all that had been, done, had been done for her and with her to deliver healthcare, which has kept her alive um, and is really looking after her in the best possible way. And she really only had praise for all the staff that look after her, um, saying what great care they, they, they provided to her. Um, but it did make me think about how there's a kind of secret story 
in everyone, but sometimes it takes a bit of time to, to find out that story in terms of their background. Um, so I also spoke to another patient who um, didn't want to have his picture taken, wanted to remain anonymous, um, but he's um, a bit younger. Um, another hemodialysis patient at St Paul's, also awaiting a second transplant. Um, was, he was born with a kidney, which eventually failed, um, when, which he received when he was 19, and that kidney transplant lasted 21 years. So, unfortunately, that failed, and for the last four years, he's been on dialysis, um, and again, comes in three times a week, six hours each time. Has a number of other health issues, has had hip replacements, suffers from a lot of some mental health issues, anxiety, was also really positive about how he was cared for, how much everyone looked after him. Um, but he wanted to talk to me about how we, what he said, put the care into patient care. And he talked about how important it was for caregivers to remember that they're dealing with patients and real people and not just bodies to be plugged into machines. And he understood the challenges given the financial constraints on staffing and limitation of resources. But he pointed out that sometimes all it takes is just to ask and to really listen to the answer about what's important to someone. And he gave me a really great example. So recently he had to go an, an angiogram, but he kept avoiding it and kind of cancelling at the last minute and not turning up for this angiogram. And finally the cardiologist sat him down and said, what's happening? Why aren't we doing this angiogram? Tell me what you need so we can get this done. And he explained that what was stopping him from coming in was his extreme anxiety about being in a hospital bay um, overnight in a room full of other patients. And he felt he just couldn't deal with sharing a room. And so he was avoiding this really important test that could have really serious implications for his health and his plan of care. So the cardiologist immediately said, I can sort this. We can make sure you have a private room. And she did. And so uh, as a result, he did get this really important test. So for John, that was, um, that's a made up name, by the way, that is personalized care. It's not the private room. It's someone really taking the time to ask and to listen. And of course, as a chief exec, part of my job is to worry about money and efficiency. And when I heard that story, as well as hearing the story about the patient bit, I heard the story about how much resources we probably wasted booking him in for things which he wasn't coming to, um, and then having to rebook it and go around the same thing, um, and how much we could have saved if we'd kind of got that right the first time. So I think sometimes we think there's a tension between being really patient-focused and being really efficient um, with our money. And, you know, sometimes there is a tension, but quite often there isn't a tension. If we get it right and patient-focused the first time, we're also more efficient with our money. So neither of these patients talked to me about how they really wanted precision medicine. They didn't ask if their genetic information had been used to decide on their treatment regime. I didn't have those words. But if we had asked them whether they wanted their treatment to be better tailored so it worked better for them, I think they'd have said yes. And that's, to my mind, all that precision medicine is, really. It's officially designed, de uh, defined as an approach which allows healthcare interventions to be tailored to groups of patients based on their disease susceptibility, diagnostic or prognostic information, or treatment response. And I think there's three types of precision medicine technologies that are likely to become widespread in clinical practice in the next decade. Omics based biomarkers, complex artificial intelligence based algorithms, and digital health applications. And variations of these technologies and approaches are already being developed and used at Providence and indeed across BC, but I think many more are still to come. And this kind of personalized medicine offers really exciting opportunities, whether on a molecular level or in the technological, virtual, and digital spheres of innovation, to optimize care through precise diagnoses and tailored treatment options. 
And there's no doubt that genes are unique and they form the basis of who you and I are. But of course, we also have to do the other half. They're not the whole story. So I think if we can combine this revolution with deconstructing patients down to a molecular level, with ironically at the same time treating the whole person, I think we've got a real magical combination. So we can deliver personalized medicine hand in hand with considering the mental, emotional, social, and spiritual needs of the people we serve and their families. And that's what I'd call personalized healthcare, both at a molecular and a social level, truly focusing on the patient as a unique individual in every way. And I think that in that way, we can also ensure that all patients are treated as equal partners in planning, developing, and monitoring care to make sure it meets their needs. So I'm always inspired by working in an organization where everyone is, in, is striving to improve the way that we provide care. And I wanted to give a couple of examples of how teams at St. Paul's are working to improve the patient focus of our service. So firstly, two of the nurses on the hemodialysis unit taking a closer look at the, the hemodialysis patient experience. So Jill Hidalgo and Christine Zamora won this year's Patient and Family Centered Care Award. And their goal is looking at the education experiences of these patients and trying to help patients self-manage this chronic illness. So I understand that Jill has only been in renal care for the last year and a half. Um, but she said it was really evident to her that there was a bit of a gap in patient education and that nurses, physicians, other caregivers didn't always ask what a patient wanted or needed. And she said it, she, it's a really busy place, there's lots of things going on, but she, the quote was, the core is the patient, we're there because of them. So Jill and her team will be meeting with patients as well as nurses and clinicians to find out how we improve the transition of a new patient to the unit. And they then hope to turn that, that information into a second project to implement improved patient education materials and processes. Maybe just simple things like offering walkthrough tours of the units rather than just handing over a brochure before a patient starts dialysis. And she's talked about the importance of looking at this from a patient perspective. She said, we're asking them to do a lot. They have so much to learn. They have to come to dialysis three times a week with these complicated machines. This is a significant life change. And that ability to walk in someone else's shoes was really inspiring to me, and it's what I think we all need to challenge ourselves to do every day. So another small research project that I'm really excited about, because it also speaks to the core of personalized healthcare that's directed by patients themselves, is one of this year's Research Challenge Award winners. So um, Christine Adair, who's a post-kidney transplant clinic dietitian, did a survey of patients when she first started in the department. And it turns out that the patient's number one concern and their priority was about bone health. So after transplant, as I'm sure many of you are aware, bone loss is really rapid, um, affecting almost 90% of transplant patients. And this can lead to an increased fracture risk and contribute to significant morbidity. And the risk of fractures is about four to five times greater than for someone who doesn't have a transplant. And immunosuppressant drugs are damaging to bone health, as are steroids. And due to also an increased risk in skin cancer, we're advising patients to avoid sun, wear sunscreen. And that does reduce, of course, their ability to manufacture vitamin D from sunshine. And so having kidney disease is a risk factor for bone loss. And so this is a real problem, and it's something that patients are worried about. Um, and we still feel that there's a bit of a gap in terms of evidence base to guide treatment. And maintaining adequate vitamin D levels sounds like one way to assist in prevention. But at the minute, we don't know whether patients are actually at optimum target levels of vitamin D. So that feels like a really good thing to find out, something that would be really helpful. And so since you understand no one's done that, Christine is planning to find out if transplant patients are vitamin D deficient. And she's going to test about 100 post-kidney transplant patients for vitamin D levels. After analyzing that data, 
There could be further studies on how big of a dose is actually needed to replenish vitamin D levels. And potentially, this could lead to recommendations to monitor transplant patients' blood work more closely. And right now, we don't routinely measure vitamin D levels. So this is potentially not complicated, it takes a small investment of money, and yet in the next year, it could yield some really important information to help improve an area of post-transplant care that renal patients have identified themselves as a priority for them. And that, to my mind, is true personalised medicine. So, as you can tell from my accent um, and from my introduction, um, I'm not originally from around here. I am used to rain and fog, um, as the UK is pretty rainy too. Um, and I was asked to think about what I um, have learned in re um, references from the UK in terms of putting patients at the centre of their care, uh, particularly in renal services. So, I worked in a number of places in the UK, including at Great Ormond Street, um, which is the um, UK's specialist children's hospital, um, the equivalent of uh, Toronto Sick Kids. And we did a hemodialysis unit for the children there. And uh, when I was there, we decided we wanted to launch a home hemodialysis program, as all the evidence was showing that home hemodialysis would provide better outcomes for these children if we could make it work. So the renal team worked really hard to put together a really comprehensive training program, and we had six weeks of in-hospital education for patients and families. And we set them up to come and live um, in our patient hotel right next to the hospital so they could come in every day and be taught and gradually take over, hopefully, some of their uh, dialysis care. And the first patient to step forward was a teenage boy. Um, and he arrived uh, one evening with his father, um, and the nurses gave him a really thick instruction manual for the hemodialysis machine, and they were really apologetic and said, please don't be overwhelmed by this. We'll, you know, you've got six weeks, we're gonna go through every page with you, um, so um, don't, you don't have to worry about it, don't even look at it tonight, just you know, rest and relax and come in tomorrow morning. The next morning, when the, he and his father turned up for training, um, this young boy said he'd read the entire manual overnight, and it was fascinating. And in fact, it was just like a car. It's very into cars. Um, and he was ready to go. He understood this machine. This was something he really wanted. He was absolutely motivated, and his brain just got it. Um, and uh, he didn't stay for six weeks. Um, he was a quick learner and he was the first of actually many young patients who were then able to make the switch to home hemodialysis and of course this was life changing for them allowing um, children and teenagers and their families to lead a much more normal life and without having come to come to the hospital three times a week um, and that really taught me that we make assumptions about patients and maybe particularly children um, and teenagers have as we all know from our own lives, minds of their own. Um, and if they want to do something, they'll get it done. So there are other much, and many other smaller initiatives from within the NHS that have also had some really powerful outcomes for patients and staff. So up in Sheffield, um, in Yorkshire, which is my, where I originally come from in the UK, um, the clinic leaders introduced what they called a getting to know you initiative with the staff. So each staff member was challenged to learn something new about each patient that the rest of the staff didn't know. And they then relayed this information to the team at handover. And the point of the exercise was to obviously learn more about the patients, but also to promote communication between patients and staff. And in a busy dialysis unit, sometimes the first thing that gets lost are good lines of communication with nurses and staff focusing on their daily tasks and trying to adhere to a schedule. And they said to me, it's easy for patients to get lost. And that little exercise really helped them bring back the core of, these are the people that we're looking after, and we are people looking after people. Um, and the other thing that they, uh, they do now um, to encourage patient empowerment actually happened by accident. And they had a young man who first came into the unit completely 
resistant and uninterested in engaging with any part of his treatment. He wouldn't make eye contact with the staff and found it difficult to even speak to anyone most days. And it became obvious to the staff that the harder they tried to engage with this young man, the more he resisted. So they kind of took a bit of a step back and thought that they might reflect on what could be done differently. But in the course of rescheduling patient times, uh, patients' bed spaces were moved around, and this young man ended up sitting next to a young, another young patient. And the two of them began to talk and chat during treatment. And they started little competitions with each other, including who could put a fistula needle in first, things like that. And then a couple of the nurses heard this, about this friendly competition, and encouraged it. And both young patients were then actually putting in their own fistula needles, starting to take care of themselves. And from there, amazingly, that disengaged patient made the first move to self-dialyze at home. And so involving patients in their own care and health choices has now become a very important part of the daily practice of that unit. Because what they discovered was that a bit of prompting and encouragement and really thinking about those patients' specific needs and emotional state, even something as simple as where they're placed, can go a long way in building a patient's confidence and helping them achieve the optimum level of personalised medicine. So every day in healthcare, we can do amazing things. I think just the idea of replacing a kidney's function, even either through dialysis, um, or through actually the surgical replacement of one kidney with another, would just be inconceivable um, 100 years ago. Um, and I often think about that in terms of, particularly for St. Paul's, which was founded by sisters um, 124 years ago, um, what would they think when we showed them a dialysis machine? They would just think it was kind of magic, amazing. So we do some really cool things. But I think that what drives our research and our drive to discover more things is the fact that there's so much that we can't do. Uh, and having to see within a hospital in every area patients who are in pain, in distress, inconvenienced, um, losing their lives because we can't do any more is what drives us to discover more, um, to push back the boundaries of what we can do. And we know that in kidney disease, the treatments are still limited. And of course, kidneys are incredibly complicated things. Um, I still remembering from my high school biology lessons how many different cell types there are in a kidney. And we tend to simplify it. I, you don't, but I think people like me do in terms of it's chronic kidney disease. But of course, there are so many different diseases that fall within that chronic kidney disease umbrella. And we need to work out how we can target drug therapies so that we don't just conduct st studies on patients with chronic kidney disease, but we target studies on the specific disease so that the drugs work for the right patients. So ideally, we would first test all our kidney disease patients to determine exactly what subgroup they belong to, and then give them the new drugs that are designed just for that specific disease. And that would revolutionize clinical trials, and I'm sure that that's the way that we're going. So to remind us of why we need to do more research to discover more, I think we just have to go to the kidney clinic um, and the dialysis units um, at St. Paul's, but also across the province. So at St. Paul's, we care for more than 1,200 patients at varying stage of kidney disease. And we have 42 hemodialysis beds serving both inpatients and outpatients. And these numbers keep growing. And we know that we can do more. If we can do more, then more patients can um, have so much better lives. And I feel that we are... Embarrass Adira in a minute. Um, <laughs> I feel that we're on the, the cusp of transformative discoveries, including research happening right here in BC. So earlier this year, I was so pleased that Genome Canada awarded almost $10 million to groundbreaking research led by a team from Vancouver Coastal that will hopefully transform kidney transplant care. Dr. Paul Keown and Dr. Sterling Bryan aim to increase the kidney transplant success rates by 50%. 
which would be transformational, wouldn't it? And their plan to do that is by using genetic technologies to better match kidney donors with patients. And of course, transplantation is the optimal treatment for patients with kidney failure, but I hadn't realized that rejection still causes almost a third of those transplants to fail. And this team are planning to investigate how we can better monitor the immune response for rejection and intervene before this occurs. In addition, uh, researchers hope to develop personalized drug treatment regimes for each recipient. So in a way, I think that's the ultimate personalization, a replacement kidney that is personally selected for you with personalized drug treatment re regimes to support its acceptance by your body. So Adira, um, who I have the privilege of working with, um, is one of Providence's kidney tra trailblazers. And of course, she leads the nationwide CanSolve CKD network. And there's so many different innovative proposals in their projects. Um, I just wanted to talk about a couple. So using bone marrow cells to restore blood vessels in the kidney and prevent loss of kidney function. And bone marrow-derived cells will be infused back into the same patient. And then the patient will be followed for a year to determine if this has improved their function. Um, and then a registry for glomerulonephritis patients. That was my challenge for this talk, to pronounce that word. Um, this is about creating a network to help develop personalized treatments for these patients, tailored to their individual needs. Um, and this research team are going to look for specific genes and proteins that we can help predict disease progression. But to my mind, the most important and forward-thinking aspect of all of this complicated research is the fundamental involvement of patients. So all of these projects are based on the priorities that patients living with kidney disease told us about. So they have determined what projects we're doing. And there are 75 patient partners supporting the design, execution, and communication for each project. And the website says, patient voices are at the center of everything we do. That's a really nice thing to say, isn't it? But I think that it's actually true, and you can see through the design of all of that work that really patients are driving um, the framework of this network and the research work. So I think that leads us back to where we started and the question. And so what I'd like people to do is answer the same question again. And see. So I think there's been a little slight change in terms of people thinking that um, the biological approach is most important, um, but still the majority of people are thinking that the social approach is more important. Um, of course it is an unfair question, and I apologize for making you choose, because we, we kind of know the answer is both. And to my mind, they're two sides of the same coin. If you asked me, what do I want? Of course I wanted to be, want to be treated as a human. Um, I want people to know that what's important to me is um, being able to climb a mountain and being able to beat my friends at Scrabble. Um, and please sort my treatment so I can do both of those. But I'd also quite like you to sort my, um, to give, only give me drugs that work with my disease and my genes. Um, so I don't want to have to choose between the two. So I apologize that I can't talk about personalized healthcare without talking briefly about the new St. Paul's because this is at the heart of our ambition um, for how we deliver personalized healthcare into the future. So we will create a hospital where we personalized healthcare is what we do, where patients will be visited by multiple specialists in a single space, so we reduce risk we enhance privacy and convenience. We make sure care comes to the patient. That we integrate technology, clinical care, teaching and research. And that we use information for smarter care. So patients own their data that they can share. That we can use that enhanced patient data to improve care based on solid medical evidence, faster diagnosis, uh, fewer errors, safer patient transitions, empowered caregivers, that we improve communication between hospital-based staff, family practice doctors, and teams right across the province. We've got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to create this remarkable health campus 
um, remaining true to our core philosophies of compassion, social justice, and innovation. But what's important to me is that this new healthcare campus is a resource for the whole of British Columbia. And the Minister of Health has been very clear to me that that's the requirement. He has said, I'm, this, we're, this amount of money that will be spent on the new St. Paul's has to be a resource for the whole province. It's not a local hospital. And so our centre needs to be um, a healthcare campus whose purpose is to support teams across the province and to encourage collaboration. It's not about telling people what to do, but truly being there to help people where, wherever you live across BC. Because the more we work together, the better communication between clinicians across the province, researchers and industry part partners, the quicker we get discoveries from the labs to our patients, whether they live in Vancouver, BC, Canada or internationally. So I have to finish this talk with my favourite Providence photo. <laughs> um, the reason I like this is that um, you can see the technology um, and the complexity of that machine. Um, and as I say, I do think that uh, people who established St Paul's um, 124 years ago would look at that machine and think, how are you doing that? And that is completely essential. Without that machine, that patient wouldn't be here. But you can also see a connection between two people, um, a nurse and a patient, um, who, are, who are connected, who are emotionally engaged with each other, um, and who are also having fun, because life's too short not to have fun. Um, and that emotional connection is also what I think healthcare is about. So all that remains for me is to say thank you to, to you all. Um, thank you, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, but thank you also for all that you do every day to look after some of the most vulnerable people in our society across BC. My, um, my mother brought me up very nicely, for which I'm very grateful to her. And um, she, one of her key rules was, Fiona, always say please and thank you. Um, and in healthcare, it's really hard to say thank you enough, isn't it? Because people every day go above and beyond what you might um, reasonably expect. And I'm sure there are days when you feel that, honestly, no one's really appreciated the fact you did that extra thing. So I just wanted to say, please believe that people do appreciate it. That myself representing healthcare leaders, we appreciate it. But also the rest of society appreciate it and that healthcare in this province is something which people are really proud of and um, absolutely acknowledge and are grateful for everything that you do. So thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take a few questions. <laughs>